Hi, everyone. This week we are looking at chapter 16, our last chapter of the semester. We're looking at the law, psychology, and society in the mental health profession. So we're looking at forensic psychology here for this chapter, um, how the legal system influences psychologists and how psychologists can influence the legal system. Uh, so we will talk about both sides of that coin, uh, again, in the realm of forensic psychology. So this is the branch of psychology concerned with the intersections between practicing psychology and research and the judicial system or the law. And so, as I mentioned, there are kind of two sides to this coin. There is how psychology affects the law and then how the law affects psychology. And we'll look at both of them. I just want to put off right out, uh, put out there right off the bat that I am not a lawyer. I don't have a, um, a law related background. This can get very, very tricky in legal proceedings. So I'm going to give you kind of some of the general um, verdicts that we can get in some of those situations, but this can obviously get very, very involved. And oftentimes when people have cases involving the law, um, you find that they have multiple verdicts and multiple, uh, you know, cases and trials over time, uh, especially in some of those bigger uh, legal proceedings or some of the bigger cases that happen. So just to, just to put that out there, but we will talk about some of the general things that we can see within this branch, which is a very popular and interesting branch of psychology. So when somebody commits a crime, uh, in order to arrive at just punishments, the courts and the legal system need to know if people are responsible for the crimes they committed and also if they can defend themselves in court, right? And if they aren't able to defend themselves or they aren't uh, responsible or aware of what they committed, uh, then it doesn't feel like it would be appropriate to try them in the usual way or to punish them in the usual way. And so what happens is when people are judged to be mentally unstable, they're oftentimes sent uh, to a psychiatric institution or a psychiatric hospital in order to get themselves uh, maybe back under balance or medication or whatever it is to get them stable. And then they're able to stay in trial. Now, when we're talking about altering uh, verdicts in order to make sure that we're arriving at just punishments, we're in the realm of something we can call criminal commitment a legal process by which people accused of a crime are instead judged as mentally unstable and sent to a mental health facility for treatment. So if somebody comes in um, into court, right, and they've committed a crime, in this case, let's go with a, let's go with murder, right? Let's go with a, that they committed murder. Uh, we are going to first try and assess, can they appreciate the crime that they committed? Um, and then also the other part of that is, are they able to defend themselves and understand the charges against them? Now, there are quite a few different verdicts that can come up when somebody has psychological circumstances that need to be considered. One of the ones that most people know about uh, is probably the most popularly known is a, a verdict called not guilty by reason of insanity. Now, a person can plead insanity, right? They can say that at the time of committing a crime, because of a mental disorder, they did not know right from wrong or could not resist an uncontrollable impulse to act. Now, insanity is not a mental illness. It's a legal term. It's a legal term stipulating that somebody at the time of committing the crime had a mental illness, which caused them to not know right from wrong, or they couldn't resist some kind of uncontrollable impulse. Maybe uh, a voice was telling them to do something, or uh, they were hallucinating or having delusions and couldn't tell what was real from what wasn't real. Uh, this is very commonly linked to people who have schizophrenia or past history of hospitalization, extreme abuse, oftentimes people who are not able to tell reality uh, apart from fiction. So uh, a lot of psychotic features and disorders tend to be uh, the ones that show up here. This is not a very commonly granted verdict. Less than 1% of the time people are actually granted this not guilty by reason of insanity verdict but a lot of people will plead it. And so what has to happen is there's a whole uh, panel, usually of psychologists or psychiatrists or expert witnesses who are going to try and decide if this person was sane or insane. Now, if somebody is deemed to be insane, then we're going to um, try them in a different way or arrive at a different verdict than if they could appreciate what they did and could defend themselves and, and so on. So a lot of people criticize this for saying it's not fair, that people are getting off easy, 
But oftentimes, if somebody is found not guilty by reason of insanity, they are sent to a mental health facility. They're criminally committed. Um, and sometimes people are committed for years and years and years or even life as they're trying to receive treatment to, to get back to into a stable position. So again, this is granted very rarely, less than 1% of the time, uh, but people often criticize it for not being fair. Some other common verdicts that we might see, and these are often uh, a little more uh, commonly granted, guilty but mentally ill. And so somebody might uh, be found guilty of murder, right? You committed the murder. Uh, we believe that you were aware of what you were doing. You were able to appreciate right from wrong and understand your actions in the moment. But you do have a mental illness, and we feel that you should be treated during your imprisonment. So someone who is guilty but mentally ill goes to jail, and they will oftentimes will receive uh, mental health treatment while they are imprisoned in jail. That one's a pretty commonly granted verdict. We can also have something called guilty with diminished capacity. Again, we find you guilty, but your mental dysfunction is viewed as an extenuating circumstance that the court should take into consideration when they're trying to determine the precise crime of which you are guilty and the sentencing that they're going to give you. So instead of maybe finding you guilty of first degree murder, maybe they find you guilty of manslaughter. So um, you're guilty, but because of that mental illness, we want to take that into account. We're going to give you a lesser verdict, a lesser sentence or lesser charges um, because we do believe that it played a role. And so these are ones that we see quite a bit, uh, maybe more commonly than not guilty by reason of insanity. One other thing that we might find here is that somebody is found mentally incompetent to stand trial. So if this happens, maybe something happened between the crime they committed and the legal proceedings. Legal proceedings and court trials can take a, a long time to get going. And so maybe the crime itself caused them to snap or have a psychotic break. Something happened in between and a person is in a mentally unstable state. They're not able to understand the charges being brought up against them. They're not able to prepare an adequate defense with their attorney. When people are found mentally incompetent to stand trial, they go to a psychiatric facility, a mental health facility, and they um, oftentimes are there for weeks to months to years, uh, depending on how long it takes to get them competent to go back and then go through the legal proceedings as usual. Uh, and so sometimes this can be a very quick process of getting them you know, regulated on their medication or getting some um, treatment. And other times this can be a, a lifelong thing where someone never hits the point of being competent enough to, to stand trial. So in, in all of these situations that we're talking about here, psychology is influencing the law, right? We're saying that because somebody has a mental illness, because somebody wasn't able to appreciate right from wrong, because they were insane at the time of the crime, right? We should view them a little bit differently and, and take those circumstances into consideration. Now, there've been some very, very famous trials um, really well-known uh, cases of people with some of these verdicts that have come up. Uh, you'll be looking at it this, this week for your discussion, uh, but just a few of them just to give you a little um, preview. And, and again, you will be focusing on this uh, for your discussion this week. Uh, some of the very famous names, and I don't want to say too much because uh, this is what you will be doing, but uh, Gypsy Rose Blanchard and, and Nicholas Godajan, right? A very uh, famous uh, example, the Gypsy Rose case. Um, a few more here, Andrea Yates, who was uh, the woman who drowned her five children suffering from postpartum psychosis. Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, another very famous case involving insanity. Uh, Ed Gein, the Wisconsin grave robber. Uh, John Wayne Gacy, the clown killer. Uh, we have John Hinckley Jr., uh, Kenneth Bianchi. Francine Hughes, who set her husband on fire while he was sleeping as a result of years of abuse. Uh, David Berkowitz, a few more here. Um, Anissa Weyer and Morgan Geyser. These were the Slenderman uh, stabbings. Uh, this one was pretty recent, just like the Gypsy Rose example. Uh, Mark David Chapman, Lorena Bobbitt, probably one of the most uh, famous names for cutting something off. <laughs> uh, then we have the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski and the James Holmes, the, the Colorado Joker killer. So these are all very big names uh, and famous cases involving some form of insanity verdict 
or extenuating circumstances. And what you'll be doing in the discussion this week is you'll be picking one of these individuals and talking a little bit about their um, background, their crimes, and their verdicts. So um, I hope you enjoy the chance to, to do that. A lot of people are very fascinated uh, by serial killers and insanity plea cases. So you'll have a chance to play around with that a little bit this week. But this is a, a fairly scary slide of folks <laughs> staring at me here. Uh, you know, definitely a lot of very brutal things uh, that were committed by the people on this page. So there's one other, um, one other side to this coin, and that is how the law affects psychology. So we talked about criminal commitment. We can also have something called civil commitment, a legal process where an individual can be forced to undergo some kind of mental health treatment. Now, if somebody is a danger to themselves or a danger to others, uh, and they meet a couple of those criteria, people can actually be forced into at least a very short stint um, of mental health treatment. And so if you've ever heard the term 5150, that's the police code for somebody being held or detained against their will because they were a danger to themselves or others. And you can hold someone for up to 72 hours if they meet that criteria, along with a few others, which we'll talk about in a moment. But this side of the coin is protecting patients' rights. So these are things that are uh, being exerted or influenced on therapists and clinicians people practicing psychology to make sure that they aren't violating the rights of their patients or clients. Now, uh, this can be a very fine line. Patients have a right to treatment, but they have a right to refuse treatment. So you can't force somebody to do something against their will, but you also can't not treat them. So this is a very delicate balance. You have uh, the right to treatment. Patients have the right to receive adequate treatment. Now, for many, many years, people were locked up in asylums and state hospitals where they didn't receive adequate treatment and they couldn't release themselves. Now, that's not something that can happen anymore. If you're committed involuntarily, it's typically for a short time um, and because you don't have the capacity to make those decisions for yourself. But you do have the right to adequate treatment. They need to help you and help you in adequately uh, and sufficient ways that are appropriate for what you're experiencing. You do on the flip side of that, they'll have the right to refuse treatment. So let's say that you are um, hospitalized and they would like to give you medication. You have the right to say you don't want that medication or you don't want electroconvulsive therapy. Now this could be overridden by a family member um, or a doctor if you aren't of sound mind or judgment to make these decisions for yourself. So this is a really difficult balance of trying to protect patients' rights uh, without so you don't want to deprive people of opportunities for recovery, but you don't want to force things on them either. So uh, just trying to make sure that people get adequate care. Uh, you can't, uh, there's so many movies, I see this in shows all the time. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Unsane, it was a really interesting show about being uh, committed against your will, kind of being tricked into being committed and then not being able to be released. Uh, you know, a lot of these things are very fictional. You do have a lot of rights as a patient, uh, especially if you have checked yourself into a facility, uh, you typically have the ability to check yourself out as well. Now, um, the last slide, last slide of the semester, wild, I can't believe that we're here, right? Uh, but there are a lot of ethical guidelines for people who practice uh, therapy or counseling services, any kind of mental health profession. And we call these the code of ethics. And if you go on to graduate school to become a counselor or a therapist or um, a social worker or school psychologist, you will learn all about these different ethical guidelines, these principles and rules of ethical behavior designed to guide your decisions and actions and, and protect the rights of your clients. Now, this is a, a difficult, often a lot of gray area in here. So in general, as long as you are making your best faith effort to not harm someone, you are um, discussing and collaborating and uh, you know, trying to get the opinion of other people and you report things when they need to be reported, you're generally in a good spot. Uh, but there are definitely things you can do as a mental health professional that violate the code of ethics and they can have intense consequences such as losing your license, uh, being fined, going to jail. Uh, the, it ranges quite a bit depending on on what you have done. But some of the different ethical guidelines, I have a, a list of them here. 
uh, and there are of course way more, psychologists are permitted to offer advice. Seems super basic, right? That's what you go to a psychologist for. But uh, psychologists are permitted to give you their opinion, offer advice that can go on TV or the radio or whatever and offer advice to other people that is permitted as long as they acknowledge their limitations and stay within their knowledge base. So if you don't know the answer, uh, you need to acknowledge that. If you're not comfortable working with someone, you need to acknowledge that. But you are able to offer your advice and opinion. Uh, you cannot conduct fraudulent research or publish false data. So you can't uh, publish things and manipulate the data. You could lose your license or just be shamed and kind of shunned in the professional community. Uh, psychologists who make evaluations and testify in legal cases must base their assessments on sufficient information and substantiate their findings appropriately. So if you are uh, being an expert witness, you have to have sufficient information you need to make sure that you are unbiased and performing these assessments um, in an appropriate and professional manner. Psychologists may not take advantage of clients or students sexually or otherwise. A lot of rules about what we call dual boundaries. Oh, hello. <laughs> oh, look, the, the fun of, um, of teaching from home. I've got a, I've got a cat. Yeah. If you lay down, you can stay. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> Hopefully you could still take me seriously with my absolutely adorable uh, cat right here. <laughs> so uh, there are a lot of rules, as I was saying, about dual boundaries. So you can't have a dual relationship with a client or a student. So uh, <laughs> it's totally distracting me, right? I'll try and ignore him here. Uh, so for example, if I were still a therapist, I couldn't be your therapist and your teacher. Right, that would be a dual boundary. I would have too much power, too many dynamics with you. Uh, you can't be in a relationship with a therapist or a relationship with a professor or somebody who has that power dynamic over you. Um, there are a lot of rules about relationships between clients and therapists. Um, there are a lot of rules in general, but about relationships specifically. If you are encouraged to avoid dual power dynamics or rules as much as possible. So if you live in a small town, this might be a little bit tricky, but you shouldn't be uh, having someone who's your client and they're also your dentist, right? Or um, for example, when I was uh, becoming a counselor, I was in a small town and I was still in college. I was working at Starbucks and I started having some of my clients come into Starbucks and it was like this really awkward power dynamic uh, that I needed to shift. And so I had to stop working there uh, to try and avoid those circumstances. But you need to try and, and not have power dynamics with other people. There is actually a rule that you have to wait three years between when you saw a client and entering into a romantic or sexual relationship with them. So uh, mark your calendar, right? <laughs> you have to wait um, a period of time to make sure that you no longer have um, that connection and that power dynamic over them. So just something to, uh, to take very seriously. The media loves to portray therapists breaking this boundary, uh, but it is something that could cost you your license um, and more, right? So it's very, very serious. The other really big one on here is confidentiality. You have a ethical um, obligation to not divulge information that you obtain from a client. So if a client tells you things, that stuff is told to you in confidence. You're not allowed to share that with anybody else. The exception is you could share that with another therapist. Therapists oftentimes will confer and uh, collaborate with other therapists. They, they will sit down and debrief, talk about diagnoses, and kind of go through their cases with other therapists because those therapists are also bound by confidentiality. Very common for therapists to go to therapy themselves uh, for this reason and to have a chance to process things because they're not allowed to share it with other people. And I have to tell you personally, this was something that was always so hard for me. I would wanna come home and tell my partner all about my day, but I couldn't because those things are bound by confidentiality. They can't be shared. Now, there are some exceptions to that. As a therapist, you have a duty to protect. So you have to break confidentiality under certain conditions. If somebody is a danger to themselves or a danger to others, you have a duty to protect them and to tell someone. So you have a duty to make sure that they get help 
um, or to contact um, someone to let them know that they're in danger. So if somebody has like an active desire to harm someone else, you have a duty to warn them. Uh, the other examples that you might hear of here are if there are cases of child or elder abuse, you also have a duty to step in and protect. Now really wild, and this is such an interesting example, your therapist, let's say you tell your therapist that you murdered 20 people last week. They legally cannot share that information with anyone. You could divulge to them that you murdered multiple people and they have to keep that information confidential, right? It's like a confession. Think about it that way. Um, now, if the, there's are, there are ways around this, but if they said, I'm going to murder 20 people tomorrow, completely different situation. You have a duty to warn those people and to, to call protective services and take action. So this can get really, really tricky, which is why therapists oftentimes confer and discuss with other therapists to make sure that they're following the guidelines and rules. Uh, but you have a duty to protect that information so that people feel safe in telling you it. If they knew that you were going to share it, it might uh, make it much harder uh, for them to want to, to open up. So uh, lots of cases of, uh, of circumstances where these things have to be uh, kind of altered or you have to take that into consideration. But for the most part, the things that you share with a therapist stay between you and them um, as long as it doesn't violate that, that duty to protect. So uh, that is it for, uh, for this chapter. That is the last chapter in our class. Uh, Rolly has made himself very comfortable here, <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, but hopefully it was, it was cute and not too distracting um, for me as well. It's my favorite cat. But uh, please make sure that you get going on all the other required weekly uh, materials and get everything done before the posted deadlines. Have a wonderful break. Um, and I hope all of you, uh, yeah, just have a great break. Take care of yourselves. And I hope I, I see you in the, in the future.